In today's Lost Media instalment, we're going to be taking a look at several topics and projects, either being lost episodes, deleted scenes, or concepts that never quite pass the conceptual stage, all of which evolves around the holiday of Christmas. So if you're new here and this sounds like your type of cup of tea, then don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more like it, as it would be humbly appreciated. Alright, that will do for the context, let's start our program. Basil Rathbone was a famous and well-respected Shakespeare actor for his time. He was best well known for playing Sherlock Holmes in 14 movies, and additionally did numerous reappearances dawn in the costume in his later life. During the 50s, he was part of two Christmas Carol's adaptations made for television, the first of these airing on the 23rd of December 1954, titled simply A Christmas Carol, made for the Shower of Star show, with small musical numbers implemented within the special. Rathbone played the role of the ghost of Marley for the show. The program had condensed the story quite a bit to fit within an hour's time slot. Sally Fraser, who played Scrooge's love interest Belle, additionally fulfilled the role of the Ghost of Christmas Past. And then Ray Middleton, who plays Scrooge's nephew Fred, additionally plays the Ghost of Christmas Present, the special ridaways of the Ghost of Christmas Future. Instead, the third act is heavily condensed, having a bird that leads Scrooge to a graveyard, where he comes across the tomb of both Tiny Tim and himself. The program was produced on film and in colour, which was extremely unique for a TV production of its time. But alas, only a black and white film copy has survived to present day. The other Christmas Carol production that Rathbone was a part of was a live musical production that aired two years later on NBC, titled The Stingiest Man in Town, with Rathbone now playing the main lead, Scrooge. The special was immensely well received. Later in 1978, it was remade by Rankin Bass Productions as a 2D animated TV special. For many decades, the remake was the only version of the musical that was commercially available. For Christmas Carol lovers, the original was considered to be a great lost holy grail, as it was presumed that no copies had survived. But rediscovered in a retired executive's house, was a full copy of the program that was later restored for a DVD release in 2011. It was a kinescope copy, meaning that it was recorded via somebody pointing a camera to a TV monitor, although it's worth noting that the original broadcast was in colour, but due to the preservation technique it only survives via a black and white copy. Still though, at least we can watch it today. The 1964 Rankin Bass Rudolph If you've been specifically looking into missing animation media for a little while now, then chances are you may be already familiar with the original cut of Rudolph. In the special, Rudolph, Hermie and Yukon travel to the island of misfit toys, leaving with the promise that them and Santa will find them a new home. Rudolph, I promise, as soon as this storm lets up, I'll find homes for all those misfit toys. Although by the end of the special we never see this fulfilled, this led to many children writing in being unsatisfied with the ending. So the following year when the special was re-telecast, it featured an additional scene with Rudolph, Santa and the rest of the reindeer returning back for the misfit toys, and by the end credits they dropped them off along their travel. During the 90s the film went under a major restoration work. Newer copies of the film re-included some previously missing scenes that were cut out for reruns in order to make room for the new scene of the misfit toys by the end. The only scene that was still missing from the first broadcast was just the original end credits. Rick Goldschmidt had relocated a black and white print of the special that was the original version as first broadcast. He uploaded the original end credits onto YouTube in 2011, although in 2022 stated that he has relocated a colour copy, but at the time of recording has not yet uploaded it online. But that's not the only piece of missing media from the 1964 Rudolph. All the voice work for the special was done in Canada, due to the lower labour costs within the country. Voice actor Larry D. Mann did the vocals for Yukon Cornelius, Bumble and Sam the Snowman, who reportedly Sam had a Brooklyn accent. All of his dialogue and songs were fully recorded, although the role of Sam the Snowman would be later replaced by Bill Ives, a well-established actor, singer and musician of his time. He was brought in to add further promotional value to the special, and since the voice work was done ahead 
head of the animation, the designer Sam was deliberately changed to look more like Burl Ives. The original audio for Larry D. Mann's interpretation of Sam the Snowman has never been released, and since this was for a program that was nearly 60 plus years in age, it seemed uncertain with such assets like unused audio would still exist today. Well, several Christmases ago, I was reached out by an individual that claimed that they still had it. And after doing a little bit of digging and research on my end, I can indeed confirm that it does very well still exist. Unfortunately, it's currently stuck within a limbo, and for people that have been trying to access it, has led them round in circles. So if you do locate on who currently has the possessions of the tapes, then it's probably best to not get involved. And I've been personally advised to block the fella. From what I've been told, the whole situation is really shady. Christmas Night of the Stars was an annual BBC program that aired between 1958 and 1972, although during its 12 years on air it did miss three Christmases in 1961, in 1965 and 1966. The show mainly comprised of variety acts, singing and dancing, and comedic sketches. Unfortunately for our luxury, it was being produced at a time where British television was going through a trial period into preserving their programmes. Going by the BFI archive to see what's available to watch, the 1958 transmission does fully exist, and you can watch a 3 minute extract from it online, although the next 2 years 59 and 60 are completely lost. Sadly, the 1962 programme is currently missing, although there was recently a recreation of the Steptoe & Son segment from the special. You can view it on the Hamilton Productions YouTube channel. The 1963 programme appears to be missing as well, although the 64 show has survived, and it's one of the very few episodes that you can fully watch online. The BFI do have an extract of the 1967 programme to preview, although if the full show does still exist, I couldn't confirm. There are no known copies of the 68 program, although the audio was rediscovered and it was included for the Dad's Army Lost Tape CD. A visual copy of the 1969 show does still exist, but the 1970 show only has audio existing. The 1971 program doesn't exist, but the final episode of the original run of the show, 1972, does still survive and you can view it online. Round about 2016, a cropped image of a TV monitor displaying some kind of cartoon was posted on the tip of my tongue site, asking if anybody could recognise the character and where he may have come from. This image originated from a family picture. Friends and family tried to guess but failed to identify as to where exactly that cartoon had come from, so they looked towards the internet in A to help them. All they could say that the picture was taken in southwest Ontario in 1992. Gradually, the image became viral, and the awareness was further heightened in 2022, after YouTube channel Blame It On Hore shined a spotlight on the subject. Lucas and Josh Rashter, after catching wind of the story on YouTube, were able to relocate the animation that image had originated from. It turned out it was a Christmas elf. From the holiday special Soulmates, The Christmas Gift of Light, that was made all the way back in 1991. It first aired on television before making its way to home media. It was released on a compilation tape called Christmas Cartoons Adventures. The plot featuring a villain called Mick Bragg, who's spreading negativity everywhere during the holiday season. Santa ends up getting so neglectful and depressed that he ups and abandons Christmas, leaving Mick Bragg to fulfil that Santa role. So it's up to two intergalactic soulmates, named Orion and Orridia, to relocate Santa and help him to get back on board for Christmas. I couldn't help but notice that the narrative was somewhat set up, as if the viewer were already aware as to what the soulmates were capable of, to the extent of their powers and limitations. And the title card is The Soulmates in the Christmas Gift of Light, so I was curious if maybe this was part of a series. Maybe on the other hand, this may have been a one-off pilot, as there is dialogue indicating that this is the soulmates' first mission. Soulmates, hurry. This could be your first mission. Or maybe I'm just reading too much into things. Well, just as I was recording this segment of the video, Phelan Polius has just posted his retrospective review on the special, and from his incredible research, yes, this was indeed a pilot. Anyhow, the full special was uploaded onto YouTube at the search. In any case, this special is wrapped up in a nice little humble story on how it found its way onto the internet.
When Disney's The Santa Claus made it to DVD, Blu-ray and eventually the streaming platform Disney+, Plus, all of these later editions of the film were actually missing a rather infamous and naughty scene. In the original theatrical cut you had this joke. 1-800-SPANK-ME. I know that number. <laughs> and a Merry Christmas to you too. Allegedly the reason why that this was cut out was because that this scene featured a real 800 number that led to a general sex hotline and kids called up the number to see what the spank me line was. Reportedly there was one case where a kid called up the number leading to a phone bill that was $400. But after looking into it, I think it's pretty safe to say that these are all hoax stories as when you watch the scene all the way through, there is no display phone number to ring up on, so likely an elaborate tall tale. Given that it's a film where our main lead accidentally causes the end of Santa, perhaps the filmmakers felt that they could get away with slightly more raw jokes. Did not. But this one definitely didn't last too long now. Officially, this scene is only available via the VHS and Laserdisc releases, and you can see this scene unofficially uploaded onto YouTube in multiple places. The period between 1984 to 1989, the George Lucas Computer Division, later to be formatted into the company Pixar, dabbled and experimented with CGI short cartoons. One of their most successful short films during this time frame was titled Tin Toy, their second to final short in the 80s. At this point Steve Jobs was somewhat considering to cut off the animation department of the Pixar company, because of these short films, while heavily critically appraised, were not really economically viable. But the animation team were just able to convince him to invest in $300,000 to produce a tin toy. But even still the money was so immensely tight that when it was admitted to the Sifgraf Film Festival of 1988, the short was still not even finished so they took the risky move of ending it on a cliffhanger and thankfully it was still received immensely well. They were able to seek additional funding to fully complete the short and tin toy would go on to win an Oscar for best animated short. The first CGI film to achieve such a milestone. During the early 90s, to stay afloat, they took on commission work for advertisements and began shopping around the idea of doing a 30 minute Christmas special, featuring their Oscar winning star, Little Tinny. The plot features Little Tinny being stored away back in the 1940s. In a convenience store, he falls into a deep sleep. He wakes up many decades later, with the store now ready for the Christmas season although Little Tinny is unable to find his friends. Along his journey he encounters a ventriloquist dummy who's trying to find their owner. Disney eventually picked up on the Christmas special, although after both companies realised that the cost of producing the special would be so immensely expensive that no network at the time would have fully funded it. Disney came to the conclusion that if they were going to spend X amount of money, they might as well make it into a feature film instead. Make it a movie. Really? Yeah. Right? We got, we got it. it. Thus a tin toy Christmas would become an early prototype idea to Toy Story. Very little in terms of conceptual artwork and assets have been revealed of a tin toy Christmas. At most we have four images featured in the book Two Guys Named Joe. Out of all the Christmas movies that were made within the last 20 years, none of them have been quite as nearly as impactful as Elf. Hailed as a 21st century Christmas classic, stylistically the art department had many winks back to the Rankin Bass classics. Although during production they only had a false sense of security that they legally had the okay to emulate the style. Well when production got quite substantially along, there was a bit of an inquiry from the lawyers when they realised that they didn't have the legal blessing that they had to prepare for the worst case scenario, such as Buddy's green costume which was deliberately inspired by the boss elf seen in Rudolph. In case if they couldn't use that costume, they designed a new blue suit for Buddy. They only ended up using it for one filming day. Will Ferrell would first film within the green suit, and then once they were done he would switch into his blue suit and film the same repeated shots. At this point quite a substantial amount of the film was already recorded, including the scenes that were in New York so god forbid if they had to refilm all of that. Digital manipulation was even considered to be an easy way around it. 
Thankfully, they were able to get clearance into using the Rankin Bass designs. To date, none of the outtakes with the blue suit have ever surfaced for the public to see. But that's not the only piece of elf missing media. With the film grossing worldwide $225 million, New Line Cinema was keen on a follow up. A script was fully written and prepared, but despite being offered an estimated $29 million to come back, Will Ferrell didn't find the material in the script to be particularly good, with the recent 2022 Asda's advert featuring Buddy the Elf, where they mask and recycle the footage from the movie. It certainly seems unlikely that Will Ferrell will ever reprise the role. Now for a short while, the script was slightly elusive, only being shared in very small circles within the script trading community. But thanks to my contacts, they were kind enough to relay to me what the plot was in the script, and a small sampling of some of the pages just for this video. The plot would have featured Buddy, Jovi, and their eight-year-old daughter, Susie, adapting to a suburbia lifestyle. Although in the third act, back in the North Pole, Papa Elf gets kidnapped. So it looks like it's going to be up to Buddy and other Santas around the world to save Papa Elf. The choice for wording for some of the description may be seen as not politically correct by today's standards. Lost Media YouTube channel Hammer Studios does plan to go fully in depth with the plot in Christmas of 2023, so to retain a few more surprises, I won't reveal any more of the plot. In November of 2013, it was announced that Hummingbird Productions and Star Partners were in pre-production of a sequel to A Wonderful Life. Given the title, It's A Wonderful Life, the rest of the story, centering on the youngest grandson of George Bailey, meeting his great aunt Zuzu, one of Bailey's daughters seen at the very end of the original film. And it was planned that Virginia Patton Moss would reprise her role, being at the time the last surviving cast member of A Wonderful Life, who was six years of age during the filming of the original movie. As for the plot, Aunt Zuzu would have acted as an angel, teaching the grandson a valuable lesson, showing him the world if he was never born. With the story reportedly taking some cues from A Christmas Carol, the script was penned by Bob's Farmworths and Martha Bolton. The set release date was going to be in 2015, 69 years after the original. During early development, it was presumed by the filmmakers that the movie rights were within the public domain, thus free for anybody to make a derivative work on, but once news got out of their development, they received a cease and desist from Paramount Pictures. You see, the film was actually partially public domain. The visual imagery was free for anybody to use when it elapsed in 1974. The storyline, based on The Greatest Gift, was still copyrighted, as it was renewed in 1971. Thus, when the movie re-ran on a great many network stations, they were still obligated to pay a small royalty because of the storyline. In 1993, Republic Pictures, who owned the story The Greatest Gift, was successful into reclaiming the exclusive copyright to the movie. So somewhat successful into taking it out of the public domain. But theoretically, anybody could still sell It's a Wonderful Life, if you could somehow re-edit the movie to change its narrative completely. Anyway, as it currently stands, Republican Pictures is currently under wing of Paramount Pictures, giving them the power to stop any unlicensed sequel. So while no footage was ever filmed, we do know at the very least that a script was written, currently still hidden away. Who knows if it will ever see the light of day. The Jim Carrey 2000 holiday movie, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. The initial rough cut was reported to be about four hours long, and not counting the end credits, the final cut runs for about an hour and 30 minutes, and only just under 20 minutes worth of deleted scenes have been made publicly available, meaning there's roughly three plus hours worth of footage that are still locked away in the Universal Archive. There's been a lost media seeker recently that's been propelling the search. Grinch fanatic, filmmaker slash actor, Tom Sinclair has been trying to piece together the mystery on working out what exactly was cut, posting regular updates on his YouTube channel named, well, Grinch. Well, it started when I saw the film when I was like five and noticed a lot of stuff and then a few years later, oh, finding pictures behind the scenes I'd never seen before, um, that I found like the most complete scene that was like from TV trailers and TV spots and I sort of recreated it and edited it and 
let's try to um, remake it. I just searched wherever I could get my hands on any or anything Grinch related. I use the Wayback Machine. Sometimes I go to really old websites and I was just lucky. I went to this old website and I found video files of interviews. I downloaded them and uploaded them to my channel last week. Has anyone brought up the fact that your character is actually new? <laughs> Some of the scenes. A couple of people. A couple of very perverted people. Oh, very lucky find to find. It's it's harder to find new stuff every day. Tom is attempting to go bold and big to get the word out there of the lost extended Grinch cut. You hear all these other hashtags like release the Snyder cut and the suicide cut and whatever. And I thought the Grinch deserves an extended cut. It's a Christmas classic. So it would be hashtag release Howard Grinch cut. Perhaps the biggest rediscovery in terms of missing deleted scenes was the unearthing of the fifth draft of the script. Written just five weeks before filming began, Tom estimated that the script is about 70% faithful to what we see in the final version. He's theorised that some of the exclusive scenes in the script may have never been filmed, although this is difficult to confirm. Although one that he was recently able to confirm about was a flashback scene featuring the Grinch as a teenager, on a motorbike wearing leather, donning an Elvis-like hairstyle. I'm trying to take um, Martha May who for a test drive on his new motorcycle. The Mayo gets jealous and doesn't let her get onto the bike and the Grinch just rides off into the sunset saying, I'm not going to see you guys ever again. Healing Christmas part? Like, because there's so much that's been deleted from that, just that one part. You know, the main part of the story. However, Mr. Sinclair is on a bigger lead for even more deleted scenes from the Grinch. I've been working with a buddy in the USA who um, has storyboards of the Grinch movie, and he has all the drafts of the scripts and stuff, but he just hasn't had time to dig them out and photocopy them or anything and send it in an email for me. He's a big Grinch fan and he's a huge help. So, it looks like in the meanwhile, we're gonna have to be a little bit patient. But if you want regular updates as to what's been recently found, then I would recommend subscribing to the YouTube channel. Or, if you'd like to contribute to the search itself, then it may be worth hopping onto the Discord server to join in the fun. Um, my personal advice is to keep on searching until you find something, and don't give up too easily. It, sometimes it just takes a while to find something that you've been looking for.